I am keeping it on for the entire episode, by the way. And you ain't gonna tell me nothing, because I'm the sheriff around these parts. Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you, yes you and Dan, if you will please do a drum roll. I'm going somewhere with this, yes you who has got themselves a brand new cowboy hat. Bang, 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 mother yes, That's right. I have a custom live and let's dice cowboy hat courtesy of the one and only Hunter Hoss. And I have to give a huge shout out to you, my friend, because not only does Hunter work with leather over in Texas, but he also does pleather versions as well for those who don't want to punch cows in the face. And he made this, this custom live and let's dice hat, which is my sister channel where I do all my board games and Warhammer stuff. Go check it out. So thank you very much. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than... <laughs> Velez Griff for their suggestion of video games that were released after their console died. And this is the thing, when it comes to a console death, it's kind of a mixed bag. You have some people who are obviously very, very sad to see one of their favorite treasured platforms go the way of the dodo. But on the other side, there's brand new experiences over the horizon in higher fidelity. Ooh, look at that sun. It's burning myself, but with less pixels this time around. Ooh, it's truly what comes before that helps shape the road ahead. And so the announcement of all support ceasing for a console really is a moment to reflect on, or indeed curse aloud because now you've got to fork out a huge wad of cash for something that will likely have four games at launch and then have to wait months for anything else. Looking at you Xbox 360 and the PS5. Also joining you in that chorus of cussing are devs and publishers who sometimes just miss the boat and drop their titles weeks, months, or even years after a console had been laid to rest. Now, some of these come from bad luck, some from spite, and some, strangely, come by choice. But either way, all of these games arrived just a little bit late to the party. And that's what we're here to talk about today, as I'm Jules, the sheriff of what culture now, and this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight video games that released after their consoles died. And you know the drill by now, say hi to me here over in the live chat and put your suggestions for next week's episode down in the comment section below. But with that in mind, shall we get this rootin' tootin' cowboy f f for looting? I don't know, that, is, that, is that even a word? Show on the road! Bang, bang, bang! <laughs> Number eight, Micro Mages for the Nayers. Make no bones about it, I am in love with micro mages. Move over micro machines, move over micro brewery pubs. There is a new love in my hipstery life, and it's this NES game that was released all the way back in 2019. That's right, a whopping 24 years after the final game was dropped for the NES, that being the tie-in game for The Lion King, comes arguably one of the console's greatest ever achievements. Developed by Morph Cat Games and using just 40 kilobits, kilobytes, KB, kibbles, 40 kibbles worth of cartridge space, Micro Mages is the epitome of quality game design and ludicrous milking of every single ounce of the NES's hardware. I'm milking it for all it's got, come on! Playing as one of the titular tiny tricksters, you need to ascend a series of increasingly tough towers in order to prove to the world that big things do come in small packages. Utilizing wall jumping, spell slinging, and even roping in a buddy or two to help you out in the game's co-op mode, this is a gaming experience that is polished to a mirror sheen. Honestly, if you were to take this title back to the heyday of the Nayers, then people would have been holding this aloft as being the champion of video games and likely saying to themselves that graphics will never get better than this. I mean, seriously, the art direction in this game is mwah, chef kiss, my friend. And after playing this game for as long as I have, I too am under its spell. I think it is one of the best games ever. It's really, really fun. <laughs> Number seven, The Text Assist, the story of Ray Babir. Now, if ever there was a surefire way to wake a gamer who has unfortunately fallen into a coma up from their elongated sleep, it is to utter the words next to their head, yeah, but the Dreamcast really wasn't that good of a console, was it? Because trust me, they will fire back up like Satan himself has shoved a pitchfork in their backside. And you know what? In between all of the, well, actually, 
Trillies, that they will then spew, there is a true case to be made for the Dreamcast being the most understated and underserved consoles ever made. It had the power to be a true contender. It had some remarkable features such as online player motion controls way before the rest of the industry had even thought of these concepts, and of course, it had a slew of brilliant titles that are now sadly locked to that console forevermore. Yet very few of these titles chose to be locked away on this plastic prison. But then again, the text or sis, the story of Ray Babia, is not your average game. Created by developer Head Up, this game is kind of like a cross between Typing of the Dead and The Exorcist, and sees you sending demons and other lowlifes to hell by spelling out biblical battle cries whilst avoiding literal bullet hell. It's hilariously fun, as was the developer's decision to release this game on Steam in 2019 alongside 666 physical copies of the game for the Sega Dreamcast. When quizzed on why they thought to bring the game to the Dreamcast, the team responded in an interview with the Dreamcast Junkyard, the minute that we laid our hands on the very first PC version of the Tech Assist, our brains just started swirling, shouting, Dreamcast, typing of the dead, keyboard, bullets. We simply had to recreate this game for the best console ever released. It was unavoidable. Unavoidable, is it? I mean, you could have literally not made it for the Dreamcast, but still, I'm very glad that you did, because this game is amazing, and I will be doing a stream of it very soon on live and let's dice. Go over there. Plug, 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 plug. Number six, House of the Gun Dead. Now I have to admit here, this entry is a little cheeky because it's not exactly a title for a dead console and more a video game that came out when the entire heyday era that it represents had long since passed. But when you see what game I'm going to be talking about, I'm pretty sure that you'll forgive me. Pretty sure. Because now it is time to talk about an honest to god enter the gungeon light gun arcade game that was planned to be released in the year of our slimy lord in 2020 to arcades all around the uh oh oh dan actually wait a minute wasn't 2020 the year that all the bad stuff happened global crisis and a quick delay to this year of 2023 aside this was as much of a throwback to the heyday of the arcade as it was a love letter to enter the gungeon itself offering up a brilliantly refreshing take on the source material and delivering it in a heck and frenzied way that only a light gun game can provide the stage for. While what little arcades are left around the world are closing, this game acts as a testament to why they were so popular in the first place, as the idea of blasting away enemies all night long with some mates by your side really is a core gaming memory for many. Still, if you don't fancy trekking your way down to the local leisure centre, to the stinky corner that houses the arcade cabinets that are covered in what you pray to God is Vaseline, well don't worry my friend, because you can actually get a home copy of this for yourself for the svelte total of four and a half grand. Quality doesn't come cheap, it seems. Number five, Star Fox 2 for the Snyers. Now, Nintendo really does have a nasty habit of, um, how best to put this? Not giving us good Star Fox games? And I know this sounds like a strange statement, but let's just walk through my thesis. Firstly, we have Dinosaur Planet, a game that Miyamoto saw whilst walking through developer Rare's offices and literally said, yeah, I'll be having some of that, mate, and forced them to slap a Star Fox logo onto things and rename it to Star Fox Adventures, thus creating an experience that was in no way ever connected to the source material and bloody felt like it every step of the way. Then we have the big dollop of wallpaper paste that was Star Fox Zero, which also perfectly sums up how much love and care went into that project absolute duck egg. And finally we have Star Fox 2, an admittedly brilliant game that took Nintendo a tiny 22 years to actually bother to release. Due to a shift towards newer hardware and being developed at a time when the PS1 was swinging its digital dong around, Star Fox 2 was shelved despite being fully complete by 1995, with Nintendo citing that people would find the 16-bit graphics unappealing. Now I'm no fancy video game developer, I'm just a small-time YouTube content creator with a very sick hat, but tell me this, do you think, really think, that a sequel to one of the most beloved video games ever made was gonna sell poorly? <laughs> Why sir, you are an idiot! But what do I know, eh? Number 4, 3D Tetris Virtual Boy 
Continuing on Nintendo's strange foray into her, let me just check my notes here, oh yeah, complete and utter madness, we have the Virtual Boy, a migraine simulator that also apparently had the sub-function that allowed you to play video games. Seriously, at what point was this final concept actually approved? What about its Triffid-esque appearance was deemed okay for public consumption, and why on God's red earth was this the primary colour choice for all the games? And yes, I know it's meant to be God's green earth, but I played the Virtual Boy fairly recently, and now red is all I see. And speaking of sight, it turns out that the end of the Virtual Boy truly was a spectacle to behold, as not only did it disappear like an absolute shrinker back to the showers with just a whimper a few months after launching, but it also managed to botch its final game, 3D Tetris, because the title arrived 20 days after official support had ended in March 1995 in North America and didn't even receive a Japanese release. There is a true sense of irony that Tetris, which arguably really put the Game Boy on the map, was also also the final nail in the coffin for the Virtual Boy. Although saying that, having nails driven through your eyes was kind of an experience that Virtual Boy users were actually already pretty accustomed to. It was a bad console, dude. <laughs> Number 3. Raiden, or Raiden if you want to pronounce it like that, for the Atari Lynx. Nestled in between the battery-hungry Sega Game Gear Give me all your battery. <laughs> and the almighty 2001 A Space Odyssey obelisk that is the indestructible Game Boy sat the Atari Lynx. A goddamn ugly mother for sure, but for all of its visual sins was an absolute powerhouse of a handheld console. Thanks to clever developing tricks, the Lynx was able to offer sprite scaling in a manner similar to the Snares' Mode 7, which at the time was utterly mind-blowing, especially as this was being delivered with next to no slowdown on a handheld device. But what let the Lynx down, however, was, as with many Atari products, Atari themselves, who marketed the game in the same way that they want to promote that one of their CEOs loves to kick puppies in the face, aka they said next to nothing about the entire affair. As such, the handheld was discontinued in 1995, allowing the Game Boy to continue unopposed. Yet, in 1997, several years after everyone had all but forgotten the Lynx, Blue Sky Software decided to port the arcade classic Raiden, or Raiden if you want to pronounce it like that, for the handheld device. And why would a company undertake such a strange project? I have literally no idea. I mean, the install base for the Lynx was pretty small, and the fact that you could only get this copy of this game by going directly through specified retailers surely means that there's like, um, 10 copies out there in the wild? I cannot feel like it was a very big demand for this, but still, they did it! The Madheads did it! Number 2. Super Jetpack DX for the Game Boy Now, one of the best ways to describe Super Jetpack DX is as being a labour of love, because this game has been to the moon and back when it comes to its development story. Originally beginning as a homebrew port of the 1983 ZX Spectrum titled Jetpack, Quang Wen worked with other like-minded tech heads to bring this game to the Nintendo Game Boy in 1999, where it received modest praise within the community. Now, normally this would be where the story ends. Passionate fan wants to make a game? Makes game. I mean, the only surprising thing of this story is the fact that Nintendo hasn't sued him at this point. But it does continue! It's got a Chapter 2 electric boogaloo, my friend! And this all came about in 2020, aka the longest year ever. During this period, Quang was forced into unemployment due to the pandemic, and so returned to his Jetpack project with the idea of updating it further and releasing it as a standalone physical release for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. What this resulted in was essentially perfection in cartridge form, as Super Jetpack DX is so wonderfully addictive that the fake Nintendo seal of approval stamp that he included on the box art should be changed to a warning for your soon-to-be blistered thumbs. Now, the concept is simple here, repair and refuel your space rocket and kill everything that stands in your way. But thanks to the fact that enemies are numerous and endless, and that you can walk off one side of the map and appear on the other side, means that you'll have to enter a zen-like state of perfect accuracy and positioning. It is such a glorious game that the third print run of this title has already sold out multiple times. I love the fact that there is such a big support for this tiny, tiny and wonderful game. And number one, Putty Squad for the Amiga. Oh, Putty Squad. What the hell are you? <laughs> 
Well, I'll tell you, friend. It's a title with a release story far, far, far more interesting than the tepid gruel style of gameplay offered up by System 3 in the actual title. In fact, trying to figure out exactly what version of the game launched when will likely turn your brain to actual putty. So let's get melty. You see, the original game Putty was developed for the Amiga, and it sold as well as a game about a weird blob would normally do in this era of gaming. And by that I mean that it absolutely shifted units so much so that it immediately garnered a sequel. Thus, Putty Squad was set to drop around 1994 to 1995 on the Super Nintendo, MS-DOS, Amiga, and Mega Drive. Now, of all of these versions, only the Super Nintendo version made it to market despite other formats actually being fully completed and being sent out to reviewers. So far, so normal, right? Well, strangely, in 2013, while celebrating its 30th birthday, System 3 released the Amiga version of the game on their website. But did this after releasing a HD remake of the Amiga game for the PS4. So you've released a remaster before the game that it was based on even technically came out. What? And that concludes today's list, my friend. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. And if you want to follow us on the social medias, you can do so over on my Instagram title here, which is at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, and you can follow Dan, the lovely Dan, over here on his social medias. But before I saunter off with my chaps into the sunset, I just want to say one thing, my friend. I hope that you are treating yourself well. I hope that you're treating yourself with the love and respect that you deserve. Every single person watching this video, I just want to say thank you for supporting the channel. Thank you for supporting me and Dan. And also, you are a massive ledge, so let me return the love to you. You deserve all the best things in life. You are a massive ledge. And I mean, if you don't trust the sheriff of what culture, I mean, who else can you trust? Now go out there and smash it, but don't break the law, because the law's coming for you. I'm taking this is going way to my head already. <laughs> Big love to you all. Take care, and I'll see you next week. Peace. Pew! <laughs>